I'm very grateful for all presentations. I think they're all very interesting. I, uh, I'll, I'll provide, thank you for being awake. What time is it in Hong Kong? Um, it's not too late. It's just <laughs> around eight o'clock. Oh, okay. All right, cool. How do um, you pronounce your name? Just to make sure. Um, my name is Provise. Mm. Okay. Um, um, should I say something about the, all of the presentations, which were actually really uh, thought provoking and I think brought uh, very different ideas within this um, discussion. Um, and I, I just wanted to say something that has to do with um, the type of research that you're all doing and, and the kind of value of this research. Um, because I think that these are fields that uh, operate in a completely different time scale. For instance, uh, within the building environment and the systems that are developed there, they have a very specific economic uh, target and uh, all the systems are developed in a much faster pace than uh, the ability to give time to this research that we have within an academic environment. Uh, and I also uh, have experience with working with uh, KG Matruda uh, in the unit who was involved in the production of um, VR and AR technologies. He was working with Leap Motion, and now he's working for Microsoft. But also Jasper uh, Abel, who you uh, yes. supervised for his dissertation in the Masters, who is now work working for Oculus, you know. Oculus uh, Rift, yes, and Facebook. Yeah. So in these fields, the way that um, prototypes are developed is very fast and they just follow market forces. So I remember that Kay was always saying how it's very valuable to have that time to research and investigate ideas in a much slower pace and a more discursive uh, pace that is not really guided by these market forces. So all this research, I think, is really uh, valuable. Um, but also the way that it brings in different methodologies. For instance, I remember uh, about that you were talking about ethnography with uh, uh, Jasper and how these methodologies then can be uh, applied to different uh, techniques. And I think that in all the work that we saw today, it was not spelled out, but there are these uh, kind of more ethnographic uh, approach uh, has been in part related with some of the presentations. Yes. But um, is it okay if, I, if I, uh, I put out there a question to all the partic participants as a response to, to the papers uh, as a starting point? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, something that actually I wanted to, to raise and it would be good to see what uh, everyone thinks in regards to, uh, to the papers uh, is this idea of machine vision, uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, all these technologies, AR, VR, uh, they're not neutral. Uh, they're not uh, representing a, a neutral position. And I was wondering, and it's really interesting to have this panel, which is very mixed in terms of uh, race, uh, gender, background. But I found that in all the papers, there was a way of talking that didn't really consider these differences. And I was wondering if it's something that this idea of uh, intersectionality, uh, gender, culture, uh, race, uh, how do these uh, issues come within the thinking behind uh, the approach? Because I think that uh, it is a very important aspect. I think that there is a, a, a of all of these technologies that they assume a position of neutrality, whereas uh, and, and then in the long run, this might create some problems. So I just wanted to raise it and uh, see if the, there could be a discussion on that level. And I think we're very lucky to have such a mixed uh, panel. Y yes, I can, I can start and uh, say something, uh, Penelope. I, I completely agree. We, especially when we, we see in presentations like provide, so it is like blockchain, smart contracts, etc. The whole blockchain thing and, and, a, and a, the network of value, not 
not the network of information we have at the moment, but the network of value that is being assembled at the moment uh, is very much in that very plastic state. It could go either way. It could become something that is extremely beneficial uh, and transformative like the internet is, uh, but it could also, could also be, uh, be manipulated in perverse ways a little bit like uh, what we see today with the internet and fake news, etc. And uh, just because we have the sheer power to manipulate uh, uh, information in in, uh, in in large scale, so uh, I think uh, in moments like this, we 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 cannot forget our humanity uh, and uh, what we do for 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 society and how we want uh, this to play. So we, we need to voice ourselves and say, okay, this, there is an opportunity to fix a problem here. Let's not allow economical forces or financial forces to, to uh, skew the evolution of the technology in a particular direction. So this, this is something that I, I see and I, I, I'm, quite, um, I, I'm quite aware that we have to play this with a lot of caution. Um, maybe, maybe I can start off by saying something. Sure. Um, I, uh, for example, Professor Chris Beat, he mentioned that architects are all a little positivist because it's to our nature that we feel like we should put something out there in the world. So as designers, we have to believe in inventions. So I guess um, I also have a few AI projects that I collaborate with programmers and I'm not an expert in AI, but every time I present those projects, I get questions, especially from architects about bias and data sets. Um, for example, American algorithm don't recognize darker skins, Chinese algorithm don't recognize whiter skins. Um, usually I try to avoid an ethical response to that, but I'll, I'll try to answer the question through saying that actually for every machine learning algorithm, uh, bias is essential for the algorithm to actually be able to think and um, make decisions because the algorithm is very much modeled behind how biological neuronal bodies are thinking like humans. So I think bias, just as any other um, psychological tools, it can be useful in ways and un unuseful in ways. So I think it really depends on how we um, framework the technology and try to put it to use and also Apple mentioned about blockchain, which is also um, very related in terms of uh, bias in that, for example, the consensus mechanism that we use to reach agreement on who actually has um, the authorship to the next block, let's say. Um, for example, uh, the DAO, uh, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization, they introduce a mechanism called proof of stake. So it's like a random choosing of people based on gender, um, maybe roles or color to select who is responsible for the next block. So I think um, in terms of uh, the question of bias within, no matter if it's blockchain or AI as a digital tool, it can be helpful if we know what roles it plays within a society. And I think that's kind of a crucial, crucial question to ask as well. Yes, uh, any, Thanks. Patrick, uh, Piyush, any comments on that? Uh, yeah, I think going back to Penelope's comment about Jasper, who I also know, and his uh, capitalist pressures from Oculus. I think that's something that in my research I'm very aware of how this research might filter down into practice. Uh, I've worked at I think seven or eight practices in London in the last last few years and uh, I think the first first thing when I'm doing a research I'm thinking about is what's, what's the actual chance of having an effect upon that architectural studio and upon that design uh, and I think allowing a bit of scientific, some of the scientific validation to be lost and having a, incorporating the architect's intuition and incorporating them into the, using it as a design process rather than 
kind of definitive tool, like uh, here should research doctor point him out, but it, his is quite a kind of definitive way of using data to design. Uh, yeah, that's definitely something I'm quite aware of. Uh, and also in terms of Penelope's comment on the neutrality of this software, again, I think we need to use the technology and then step back and interpret that. And there needs to be a, like an allowed space for design or architectural interpretation of the results rather than them just being filtered straight into a product. Uh, if I may add uh, a really uh, short comment over here, I, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, uh, the feedbacks that we have received at the moment from Panel and uh, Edward. I think it is really important how we see and the data set and how we construct our framework on what are the goals. Until and unless our goals are clear, there is no point identifying or probably working on the data sets which are working on a different paradigm. For example, in uh, the research that I was carrying on, I was, I was keen on getting into the social media impressions in order to understand uh, how the city as a network is functioning in terms of, uh, uh, let me say, um, how connected are people virtually in, 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 in a uh, virtual world. So I, I probably gathered all the data set which was more oriented towards the social media and social media platforms. And then I translated to a different set of goal, which was obviously negating a lot of other factors which are dependent. Like for example, there could be a landmark over there or there could be like a really uh, a nice food joint and people like to post probably the architecture over there is pretty nice. So people end up taking a lot of pictures there. There could be any different reasons for that. But then uh, yes, all these parameters, all these, all these ethical thinking have to be included in these kind of uh, goal derivative uh, algorithm. So yeah, that, that's, that's my feeling. Like until unless the goal is, or let's say what we need, what's the input and what is the output and what, and, and in order to join this particular line, what are we compromising? It is really important to think what are we using and gaining there. And then unless the premise is pretty clear, it, uh, it, the AI is not going to help humanity in a way. So yes, that's my point. Okay. It's interesting. Um, I I have a couple of questions, Penelope. If you think I can. Of course. Yes. So I have a, a first of all, I have a, a very a, two provocative questions. One is for Melinda. Melinda, thank you very much for the for the you know overview uh, into this timeline of artificial intelligence development. I thought was very interesting. But um, my question to you is: uh, Where are the women on your story? You know, they're all men, you know, who, who said that? You know, that a few, there's a few characters that are missing. I thought the same. <laughs> the line there was like... <laughs> yeah. yeah, where are like, oh, I can even change the question. Where are the gays, lesbians and women? <laughs> you know, because, you know, yeah, you mentioned one. Uh, um, uh, uh, the guy from Manchester, I'm sorry. Uh, um, um, gosh, I forgot. It will come back. Look, I, Stephen Jobs, I admire him deeply. Um, Not the Cambridge guy? No. no, he's studying Cambridge, but he was, he was from, Cam from uh, Manchester. Uh, the one, the, Alan Turin, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, my mind is... Uh, so Alan Turin and he's like a really traumatized life because he was he was gay, uh, and then and then the women where are they? Which do you know any women in the timeline? Yes, yes, Lady Lovelace, are the Lovelace mm -hmm. the mathematician? She was the first person to propose um, to propose computer programs. There was not even computers back then, but she said. We can create machines and we can write software. She was the first one to propose software. We can write software for computers. And she did that in uh, 1837. Well, I didn't know yeah. 
exclude her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, so other love lays very important, very, very important. And she built, she built huge machines outside London, could actually compute. And she could, uh, and, and, and she, although she could not write the software to feed into the machines, uh, she proposed it. She said, it's going to be almost like poetry. You feed machines with poetry and they will do anything you want them to do. So this is, this is a very important thing. And I think we highlight something here, which is very important. There is a bias we need to deal with. You know, when you see a uh, um, uh, uh, history, a timeline of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and they are all men, uh, something must be wrong. <laughs> maybe, maybe something to mention here, which is a little bit of a lightening of the, it's that the word computer actually comes originally from uh, the people that used to compute like secretaries, but they were mostly female. So yes. the term computer is actually uh, a female computer. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, so the, the famous computers from NASA and uh, from, uh, uh, from the American aerospace um, like space project, the vast majority of them were females. They were called computers, right? And they used to calculate everything for NASA. Eventually, uh, an IBM computer came along, and actually the person who managed to program that computer and write software was a woman, was like, a, I think, a, the, the, the chief of the uh, computer, computer's team. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an army of mathematicians computing. Uh, but the vast majority of them were female. So uh, we, we need to be very careful with this, especially in, in uh, nowadays where uh, we have more and more powerful algorithms. And uh, so, for instance, uh, we saw this last year. If you have a white hand holding an object and uh, you try to identify, to put in words what that image is, you'll get the name of the object, you know. It's a broomstick, it's a, it's, it's, it's a glass or whatever it is. But if you have a black hand holding something, it's a, a, a hand holding a gun. Yeah, the algorithm, the algorithm spits this out. So we have a problem when we develop those algorithms because of the huge biases we, we, we put in, uh, maybe without realizing we put in the, in, uh, in, uh, in the software. There is actually a piece of news today uh, about uh, passport photographs uh, and how the greatest errors are rendered for uh, black females. Um, that uh, the, 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 the algorithm cannot really read correctly uh, uh, black female faces. Yes. Uh, and it comes as if uh, the mouth is half open, for instance, that this woman was complaining that uh, the algorithm was uh, wrong and you couldn't really register her face properly. Right, yes. And um, the, the other interesting, so this is, this is a question for you. So I'll, I will, I'll be quiet and I'll just let you, Melinda, elaborate on your revision. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> so yes, as, I, as I said, I didn't want to exclude this part. Maybe my approach would have been so much more like the, the mental approach of, uh, of this archetypal calculating system. So not the calculation like, uh, yes, okay, I did a timeline here, right? And uh, I should have included her as well, but um, it, it wasn't based on um, how actually calculating uh, was uh, was developed through time, but uh, how the approach to the to the original idea was shifted from time to time. So so how it was uh, based on neurosciences and uh, neural approaches, then shifted to to calculation and the logician approach, and then how how these two can come together now by this algorithmic um, um, approaches and um, maybe yes but the genders the archetypes yes maybe at the beginning with philosophers it was it was very um, male based and then through time in the past century then become involved uh, females very interestingly through through calculation and through mathematics into the archetypal philosophical field and um, 
Yeah. Yes, I, I think this is an incredibly interesting discussion. I think this is actually why, uh, like the peer review panel, actually choose to publish your paper, uh, is is because now it's really transpiring that uh, the story should be recapitulated, should mm -hmm. be revised, and now we see more than ever that the cliche that software developers should be male is actually a fallacy. Mm. It's, it's something, it, it, it's because we see this in the industry, but do we see this in the, in the industry because of um, social uh, factors or because of genuine output? Um, uh, so we, uh, we, we need uh, to, in, in the writing, writing timelines, we really need to seek the truth. And uh, sometimes we need to see uh, what is out there and, uh, and uh, how a story is being told and what actually is being uh, excluded for omission or negligence of uh, people writing, writing histories. We need, so what I'm saying is that we need to consider the political agenda of mm -hmm. storytelling uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the writing, writing history. So I think that's, that's, that's really critical. So you that, you know, like a, um, doing this work, you should really consider that. Yes, I'm so thankful to pay yeah. my attention. Yeah, we see, we see examples and they pop absolutely everywhere, but we see the examples like in Birkbeck, you know, the, the DNA structure, mm. you know, nobody, nobody told their story as it should be told. Uh, now we know, uh, now it's, it even became a play in the West End with, um, with uh, the very famous Australian actress, what's her name? Uh, very, very famous Aust Australian actress. Uh, um, so the most famous one. Uh, <laughs> Nicole Kidman? She, Nicole Kidman, yes, exactly. She was playing the protagonist in the play in the West End. Um, and she did so because she, she saw it was outrageous. You know, mm. this woman actually gives evidence of the DNA structure. She photographs it and she's forgotten. Uh, she's completely forgotten. And then somebody go, you know, the, the other researchers go around, uh, go around the corner to write a paper, etc. And they, they, the story that is told is not the real story. And I think she did that because her father is a scientist, uh, Nicole Kidman's father, I believe he's a chemist. And she was quite upset. It's something that she, she, uh, I think she had quite, quite close to her heart. Uh, and this, this is important. Otherwise, it stays as it is. Uh, and uh, and then this is an important conversation because sometimes it limits progress. Um, Penelope, do you have? Uh, I have another. Provocative question. <laughs> uh, and it's... Uh, I, I just had to, I don't know if it's a, it's not so much a provocative mm -hmm. question, it's about the role of architecture in these uh, conversations and uh, whether there is a, I'm not actually sure if all of your backgrounds are from architecture or whether you come from different backgrounds. Uh, but uh, I think that there is something about uh, spatial thinking uh, and the way that we are educated in uh, uh, architecture that is really key. And I think that it's very important that this type of thinking is applied uh, within these fields. Um, but at the same time, that was addressed a little bit to Patrick, that somehow I think that um, your project uh, and your evaluation of it um, was actually through test testers that actually are also architects. Uh, and I think that this um, skill set that architects have is very specific. It's a, a way of, of looking at things that um, has, has been educated in a very specific way. There is a skill set there. And I think that in, in the evaluation of your findings, it could be quite interesting to take into consideration, again, this, like what is the background of of the people that enter this um, this space, because obviously architects will be looking for very different um, relationships, and they already have 
preconceived understanding of spatial relationships. Yeah, I guess the question was whether you had taken that into consideration at all or um, th that skilling in architecture and its uh, influence on the findings uh, is quite important. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the first points of my research was looking at what if rather than extracting the data in an architect using it, what if it just became fed back into the test? You can imagine you know, going to Ikea and there being a space planning software that shows you four different rooms of each colour, you say which one you find the nicest, then it curves the walls to a certain radius, you say which one you think is nicest. And you could imagine a kind of a, uh, machine learning architect, essentially, that just continue, continuously creates the perfect space Still in the end, you say, I feel, I feel fantastic in the space, for example, or I feel whatever emotion you might want to feel in it. But I made the decision that actually it might be more valuable to pull out that data in the first instance and see how you can use that to inform design decisions. Uh, I think within my paper, and that's what I'm analysing, how, how useful data actually can be to inform the design decisions. Uh, and there's a huge amount of interpretation in that, but you know, you know, it goes back to the point that at the moment in architectural practice, again, if you remove all of the pressures and time pressures from it, essentially architects are just people who use themselves because they think they know the best result. Uh, public consultation, in my experience, doesn't really exist in any meaningful capacity. It's just a kind of planning uh, and I think all of the data that we're using as we're extracting it from people is some kind of form of consultation in form of design. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of ties nicely to um, Leo's question was about um, the, the project that Professor Chris Beat was mentioning the IoT and then he uh, how Professor Speed tries to describe this is that um, there's data in everything and then, but it's like what Heidegger says about the hammer. So there's a truth in the hammer, but we may never be able to access the truth. So the hammer is ready at hand. I mean, Professor um, Speed used a fork. So it, it, using the fork and then tie it very nice, nicely to AI image processing. So it's ready again, not ready at hand. And also he then also ties it to the blockchain project, which um, uh, he uses time sharing, um, financial ideas, and then to put it into our energy consumption. So it, it's like there is a truth in our economy, which is also a social emergence, but we may never be able to access it. But with all the data ready at hand, we may able to, we're able to sense part of the truth to it through communication systems like blockchain. So I think in terms of spatial design, which architect is, okay, Professor Spies say architect is like business designer. I would probably not agree fully. I would say like probably architect is system designer, um, but like how will we be able to be comfortable about not knowing everything, um, but at the same time produce designs that can benefit the user group that we're targeting. So, and how the design of the virtual architecture translate into the physical architecture would probably be like the job of an architect for the next decade to come, I think. Okay, uh, I would like to add a small point over here uh, to answer Penelope's question about uh, the spatial considerations and how uh, an AI can pro probably like, tackle uh, the spatial forms. Uh, I personally come from an architectural background, so I've done my bachelor's in architecture in India. And uh, while doing the research uh, about the spatial analysis and how how I could derive a city which can learn from the visual preferences, yes, sometimes the outputs from machine learning or an AI is not aligning to your vision in order to create the spaces that you probably would have imagined it to be. Then it is in our hands to probably choose or probably make the right decisions whether this is what we are actually going forward with 
For example, I was running a simulation where I wanted to have a maximum visibility, right? So what AI or let's say what uh, an algorithm was suggesting me was to probably remove all the building from that particular area so that you have the maximum views. I mean, there you go. But that's, that's not the solution, right? So, so again, you have to find the right balance between, uh, let's say, to have a proper or let's say a well-defined spatial uh, environment, spatial connectivity in order, uh, along with uh, the inferences or let's say the outputs from uh, a machine learning algorithm. Indeed. Well, I have nothing to add, uh, Penelope. Yeah, I'm, no, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. I'm actually looking forward to the other provocative question by. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go on, uh, <laughs> <laughs> then. So, <laughs> yeah, so. So Patrick, I, 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 a quick question. I think, um, so through your presentation, you, 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 you get, um, you, you show this, this kind of frustration with this transmission of the vision in architecture, that we architects, we imagine something, we create it, and then other people see it and they say, oh, uh, it's wonderful, I like your building, but sorry, I don't, I don't share the same emotional rapport, this, the same emotional connection with the space you are proposing. So, um, and uh, you think this should be more scientific. So I'm, uh, it's the idea of transmission. How do you transmit architecture? Because uh, the conversation yesterday with Professor Jeffrey was a lot like how, and we laughed a lot together because I was trying to explain to her what happens in my brain when I'm making cardboard models. Yeah. And there is a lot going on there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, how do, how do we differentiate between space and form, et cetera. And as she knows, and as she can, show a lot of evidence, conclusive evidence sometimes that are two very different mechanisms in the brain, you know, generating form and, uh, uh, and encoding space. So you have some, th th that dilemma, th that, well, that conversation there. So in your case, how do you think uh, uh, we can better transmit concepts of, uh, uh, or the vision of architecture? And uh, how do we uh, negotiate science in, in all this? Because some people, and I don't necessarily agree with this, but some people say that science can suffocate creative processes. Mm. Well, I think if you take an architect like Peter Duntour, who I think is often re renowned for this, one, having this deeper understanding of how light and material might affect the mood of someone in their building. Mm -hmm. And I think he actually draws only in, he only ha uses hand-drawn techniques in his office or something. Not sure if that's true, uh, but there is something about the research that's happening within cognitive neuroscience and within environmental psychology, which it doesn't undermine that, but it does call into question about you know the decisions that we make. They can be tested. Uh, I think if you asked any architect, would they like to build a complete one-to-one -one replica of a building they're designing before it gets built? I think they would, wouldn't they? You know, any architect, mm -hmm. would, any architect that wouldn't like to build a complete replica of their building and test, test how people interact with it, you know, I, I would say they're probably lying or being arrogant because they're saying they already know how it's going to affect people. Uh, and it does go back to this public consultation process that it's, it is about taking on board data, interpreting it and making the most informed decision you can. Uh, and, and, you know, going back to the kind of capitalist pressures of all of our design professions in architecture or not, you know, how, how this research actually fits into an architectural process, like at what RBA work stage does this happen? You know, is it a stage two, is it concept design? You know, so I think that's quite an interesting discussion as well. Uh, yeah, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, it's said or, that, is it, or is it something that happens all the way through, mm. but for different purposes? I think that's also something. To... Yes, there is. A, yeah, when a, when a, you know sometimes as people criticize that you know you get like a, one of those world famous signature architects like you know Patrick Schubacher, Zaha Hadid architects, or, or Norman Foster. 
and then uh, they feel they have that license and the client also feels because they go to people like that people who do not like to compromise on the final uh, project on the final outcome of a, of a project that uh, if they realize something towards the end of the design of a project they realize that something needs to be changed it will be changed and sometimes that uh, that awakening to you know a flaw in the design because something has not been seen or something has not been realized or perceived by the team uh, even in very late stages things do change and uh, and uh, the, the the timeline of the project changes and so on uh, and uh, this is a huge um, this is a huge uh, treat for an architect it's a huge privilege to actually be able to in the very late stages change everything if necessary uh, but often it doesn't happen uh, and I think that, that transmission of the vision and uh, through design it's something that can be hugely improved with the new emerging technologies so we don't have to do things like that uh, because when you do it uh, I, 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 I like to believe I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm a, I like sustainability and I like to believe that my carbon footprint is very, very small. I like to cycle to school, etc. cetera. So uh, when, I believe that when you change a project in the very last minute or in the construction site, everybody pays a price, you know. There is a huge waste. Uh, I don't like to have, I don't like the idea of a wasting absolutely everything, energy, time, materials, everything in the very last minute. Uh, and this, this is possible because, but uh, at a very high cost, uh, to everyone, um, uh, but I think uh, we now see a, a frontier, a light in the frontier that we can use those technologies to to avoid to get to that stage, avoid situations like that. Um, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, everyone. I think I need to to, to go. To but go. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the papers. They were all very uh, thought provoking and. Uh, very well prepared, I must, I must say, that they were very uh, precise and very well prepared presentations. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Penelope, thank you very much for your time. It was a, a real treat to have you uh, hosting this session. Sorry, I haven't been very engaged uh, recently. I have been so busy these last few months. It has been incredible. Yes. Okay, so now we will break for lunch. Uh, there is a, a link. Uh, a, a Zoom link uh, if you want to carry on talking during lunch. Uh, uh, we, we will stop this call and then we'll resume again at two o'clock. Thank you, Abel. Thank you. Thank for you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Cheers. Bye.